Let's pray for a moment. Loving God, we have heard the words you have handed down to us, the words that were told around 10,000 campfires before they were written down, the words that we hold close to our hearts. Help us see clearly as possible the depth and richness of their meaning. Amen. So, it was usually a trap. Whenever in the Gospels Jesus is being asked a question by an outsider, especially a Pharisee, it's usually an effort to trick him into saying something that he'll regret later. Now, this reminds me of something of what is known as cabinet outs on Thursday mornings. Reporters gather in the legislature or near the legislature in the place where the government does news conferences, except this time it's one-on-one -on -one in something we call scrums, groups of reporters who gather around a particular cabinet minister. Um, and I do it myself from time to time. So the, re the cabinet ministers will pop in one at a time after their meeting. The reporters all try to ask really tough questions in an effort to get the ministers to veer off their pre-arranged and pre-prepared messages and say something real. The ministers try to stay on message despite our persistence. Most of the time, the journalists can predict exactly what answer they're going to get to any particular question. And sometimes it gets a little heated and the result is what sometimes is called a Canadian compromise. Everyone leaves the room equally unsatisfied. <laughs> it, it's kind of like ballroom dancing when everyone is trying to lead. But, you know, for all of its weaknesses and shortcomings, I still think that process is necessary in a democracy, and a lot of other people seem to think so too. So with that modern weekly event for comparison, it's just a little easier to imagine the context for Jesus. And I'm sure anyone who's ever been a cabinet minister, minister or, a, or a, an alderman or, or a member of council uh, would be delighted to hear me compare journalists with Pharisees. I mean, not that Pharisees were necessarily a bad people, but um, that's a different sermon altogether. But this one time, this one time, it wasn't a trap. And it was a scribe, not a Pharisee, asking the question. He had overheard Jesus, and he was impressed. The answer the scribe would most likely have had in his mind came from a Jewish prayer called the Shema. This was a prayer said every day, sometimes many times a day. And it begins with, Blessed be the name of the glory of his kingdom forever and ever. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Not to in any way minimalize it, but some versions of the Shema go on for quite a bit after that. And you will certainly recognize the first part of the great commandment. But there's more. Jesus goes one step further after this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And as Jesus tells us, everybody is our neighbor. Although I didn't find it in the versions of the Shema, I looked at the second part of the great commandment is in other places in the Old Testament as well. So back to Jesus and the scribe. 
we can certainly see the questioner walking away, humbled and very clearly impressed. Now, one Sunday, Stephen, you know that guy, our real minister, um, he asked Daryl, who is not here this morning, to remove one of the heavy old hinges from one of our doors to show us a metaphor, a physical, hard metaphor of how the two parts work together and how those two things are inseparable. They just don't work if they're taken apart. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, there is something else in the Shema and elsewhere. This commandment in prayer form, and I think you just heard it, was to be taught to your children. You shall teach them thoroughly to your children, and you shall speak of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk on the road, and when you lie down, and when you rise. We're not just supposed to say and think these words. We are supposed to drink these words of living water and let them permeate every cell of our bodies. We are supposed to live these words. We are supposed to be these words. And oh boy, I hasten to add, I fail. I fail sometimes most miserably every day to live up to that standard. There's an old saying that preachers preach the sermon they need to hear themselves. And I think that may apply here this morning. Now, there's a quote from St. Paul that's useful here. His letter to the Romans, chapter 7, verse 15. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. It's one of those times when Paul really puts his finger on the human condition. We learn the words, the great commandment, as children, all of us in one form or another. And then as adults, out we go every day into the Darwinian jungle of the world, and we know what happens. Some of us also pick up what I feel is some bad theology along the way. Then religion can become a faith of just rules and requirements. Now, we've seen what one old friend of mine has called TV Bible bashers. And some of us have been in the small C conservative churches, which aren't all so extreme. And some of us have seen and heard about the prosperity gospel. And the impression that one gets is that all that really matters is that you believe John 3.16 in your heart. So then you're instantly forgiven and, and you're going to heaven. You know, you just like putting coins in a slot in a, in a machine. And out comes the ticket, you know, to go to heaven. And so that's great. Now you can ignore Christ's preferential option for the poor and go back to ignoring or even exploiting people and raping the planet. And it's all good. It's easy. It's uh, simple. Don't we like simple answers? Our lives can get so complicated, simple answers can be a comfort. Too comfortable. We are still left with the imperative to live the great commandment. The letter of James is a very practical memo to all the Christian people at that time. He's blunt about things, and I think that's part of, part of what I like about him. He sounds almost as cranky as old Paul when he talks about a faith of doing, doing, not just believing. This is from the translation called The Message. Dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, you come across an old friend 
dressed in rags and half-starved and say, good morning, friend, be clothed in Christ like the lilies of the fields, be filled in the Holy Spirit and walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup or coffee. Now, where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? And another translation, faith without works is dead. Now, that's strong stuff, isn't it? And it feels like a terrible burden sometimes. So what am I supposed to do? Try to save the whole world? What can I do? Well, for one thing, you can take a, bre a very deep breath and slowly let out to start with. For one thing, there's a wise saying from the Jewish Talmud that says, if you save just one life, just one life, it is as if you have saved the whole world. And that's where discernment comes in. Listening for the call. That call can take many forms. Maybe it's just a still, small voice inside. For some of us recently, it took the form of an image seen round the world, the body of a small child on the beach. The call can even be seen in the weekly church bulletin. There was an excellent article by our former moderator, David Giuliano, in the October issue of The Observer. Now, it might have been easy to miss with all the other stuff about general counsel and the money the National Church doesn't have anymore. But he talks about visiting a wealthy man. Now, painting a picture with words, he mentions the oak floors, the marble countertops, and expensive espresso machine in a very, very fine house. This man he calls Gregor, not his real name, by the way, has all the nice toys. The beamer in the driveway, the shiny RV, bass boat with all the accessories, this being Ontario, lots of bass fishing, a four-wheeler, and even two snowmobiles. Now, this man talks about being grateful for his big paycheck after years and years and years of climbing the corporate ladder. He says he has everything, he's grateful for it, but he's miserable. Now, David asked Gregor, who has, Gregor has tears in his eyes, about the source of his sadness. And Gregor says, well, I am a selfish man. David thinks about it, and he has to agree with him. He doesn't give to the church, although he's very quick to call upon David in a crisis. He doesn't volunteer. He's never donated money to charity. And David suggests, well, he could reach out, help somebody, make some donations to worthy causes. But Gregor says it's impossible. He just can't do it. He's got this feeling that everyone should earn everything they have. As if any, any of us have ever earned anything we have. Everything is a gift. So just like the two halves of the hinge, just like the two parts of the great commandment, having it all, being grateful, is simply empty without generosity. One of the things I like about this group of friends gathered here this morning, and I do consider you friends, is that you are generous with yourselves from the heart. You are people who do things. You do things to make this building better serve the community, the inner community gathered here this morning, and the outer community. Our efforts reach out across half a world to help refugees in the grace-driven Heart of Dartmouth initiative. 
Grace is working toward becoming an affirming church, truly open to all. There's a lot of exciting things going on right here. This is not the closed, complacent world of the comfortable pew that Pierre Burton wrote about some 50 years or so ago. And yet, I want to be a little careful here because it is possible to get too much caught up in doing, overwhelmed by the calls that come from outside of us, that drown out the call that comes from within, the call that comes from Christ. We don't want to become empty do-gooders either. We need to be compassionate with ourselves, and we all have different capacities in time and energy and money. And perhaps most important of all, we need to keep going back to that well of living water now and then and drink deeply of the Spirit in prayer, in reflection, and renewing our sense of wonder about creation and everything else, including music. We have to remember that if you are in a situation where you can do nothing but pray, praying is still doing something, doing something wonderful and meaningful. Amen.